Hello and welcome to another installment of our virtual play reading series here at the Studio Theatre Tierra del Sol. I'm Nathaniel Nimi. I'm the resident director at the studio and the director of today's piece, A Woman of No Importance by Oscar Wilde. I want to give a shout out and thank you to our team working behind the scenes to put these readings together every week for you. And you can join us here every Friday at 1 p.m. on Facebook Live and the Village's Entertainment YouTube channel and tune into our virtual play reading series. Um, at the end of the play, about five minutes after our play uh, ends, you can join us for a live talk back and ask us uh, those burning questions that you've been sitting on through the whole, the whole play. And I and the cast will be so happy to uh, answer and discuss the play with you. Um, that will be on Facebook Live about five minutes after this ends. And uh, you can find the link to that in the, rec uh, in the comments on this recording or just refresh your Facebook page and join us there. It will pop up. And now, let us introduce the cast of A Woman of No Importance. Gang, you can come on down. We have, playing Lord Illingworth, Trevin. Hello, I'm Trevin Cooper. I'm an actor, director, and theater professor in Central Florida. We have Lon, playing Sir John. Hi, I'm Lon Ward Abrams. I'm an old actor in the Villages, Florida. We have Sean playing Lord Alfred, Farquhar, Francis, and doing our narration for us. Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Cullen Carroll. I'm a theater artist and theater teacher from New York City. We have Joe playing Mr. Kevill. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Lorenz. I'm an actor and improviser here in Winter Garden, Florida. We have Michael playing Dr. Daubeny. Hi, I'm Michael Siles, an actor from Daytona Beach, Florida. We have Josh playing Gerald Arbuthnot. Hi, I'm Josh Kimball. I am at the University of Central Florida, pursuing an MFA in acting. We have Allison playing Lady Hunston. Hi, Allison Johnson. I'm an actor in Claremont, Florida. We have Patty playing Lady Caroline. Hi, I'm Patty McGuire, and I live in Altamont Springs, and I'm an actress in Central Florida. We have Monica playing Lady Stutfield. Hi, I am a performer, designer, and maker of things here in Orlando, Florida. We have Sarah playing Mrs. Allenby. Hi, I'm Sarah French, a theater artist in Winter Haven. Rachel playing Hester Worsley. Hi, my name is Rachel Whittington, and I am a actress located in South Florida. And Whitney playing Mrs. Arbuthnot. Hi, my name is Whitney. I'm an arts administrator and actor here in Wildwood, Florida. Thank you, cast. Uh, take it away. We're going to go to places. Places, everybody, for top of show. Please enjoy A Woman of No Importance by Oscar Wilde. front of the terrace at Hunston. Sir John and Lady Caroline Pontefract and Miss Worsley sit on chairs under a large yew tree. I believe this is the first English country house you have stayed at, Miss Worsley? Yes, Lady Caroline. You have no country houses, I am told, in America? We have not many. Have you any country? What should we call country? We have the largest country in the world, Lady Caroline. They used to tell us at school that some of our states are as big as France and England put together. Ah, you must find it very drafty, I should fancy. John, you should have your muffler. What is the use of my always knitting mufflers for you if you won't wear them? I am quite warm, Caroline, I assure you. I think not, John. Well... You couldn't come to a more charming place than this, Miss Worsley, though the house is excessively damp, quite unpardonably damp, and dear Lady Hunston is sometimes a little lax about the people she asks down here. Jane mixes too much. Lord Ellingworth, of course, is a man of high distinction. It is a privilege to meet him, and that member of Parliament, Mr. Kettle. Kettle, my love, Kettle. Well, he must be quite respectable. One has never heard his name before in the whole course of one's life, which speaks volumes for a man nowadays. 
But Mrs. Allenby is hardly a very suitable person. I dislike Mrs. Allenby. I dislike her more than I can say. I am not sure, Miss Worsley, that foreigners like yourself should cultivate likes or dislikes about the people they are invited to meet. Mrs. Allenby is very well born. She is a niece of Lord Brancaster's. It is said, of course, that she ran away twice before she was married, but you know how unfair people often are. I myself don't believe she ran away more than once. Mr. Arbuthnot is very charming. Ah, yes, the young man who has a post in a bank. Lady Hunston is most kind in asking him here, and Lord Illingworth seems to have taken quite a fancy to him. Mr. Arbuthnot has a beautiful name. He is so simple, so sincere. He has one of the most beautiful natures I have ever come across. It is a privilege to meet him. It is not customary in England, Miss Worsley, for a young woman to speak with such enthusiasm of any person of the opposite sex. English women conceal their feelings till after they are married. They show them then. Do you, in England, allow no friendship to exist between a young man and a young girl? Lady Hunston enters, followed by footmen with shawls and a cushion. We think it very inadvisable. Jane, I was just saying what a pleasant party you have asked us to meet. You have a wonderful power of selection. It is quite a gift. Dear Caroline, how kind of you. I think we all do fit in very nicely together. And I hope our charming American visitor will carry back pleasant recollections of our English country life. The cushion there, Francis, and, and my shawl. The Shetland. Get the Shetland. Gerald Arbuthnot enters. Lady Hunston, I have such good news to tell you. Lord Illingworth has just offered to make me his secretary. Well, his secretary? That is very good news indeed, Gerald. It means a very bright future in store for you. Your dear mother will be delighted. I really must try and induce her to come up here tonight. Do you think she would, Gerald? I know how difficult it is to get her to go anywhere. Oh, I'm sure she would, Lady Hudson. If she knew Lord Illingworth had made me such an offer. The footman enters with a shawl. I will write and tell her about it and ask her to come up and meet him. Just wait, Francis. That is a very wonderful opening for so young a man as you are, Mr. Arbuthnot. It is indeed, Lady Caroline. I, I trust I shall be able to show myself worthy of it. No, I trust so. Well, you have not congratulated me yet, Miss Worsley. Are you very pleased about it? Well, of course I am. It means everything to me. Things that were out of the reach of hope before... Maybe within hope's reach now. Nothing should be out of the reach of hope. Life is hope. I fancy, Caroline, that diplomacy is what Lord Illingworth is aiming at. I heard that he was offered Vienna, but that may not be true. I don't think that England should be represented abroad by an unmarried man, Jane. It might lead to complications. You are too nervous, Caroline. Believe me, you are too nervous. Besides, Lord Illingworth may marry any day. I was in hopes he would have married Lady Kelso, but I believe he said her family was too large. Or was it her feet? I forget which. Oh, tell Henry to wait for an answer. Will you come for a stroll, Miss Worsley? With pleasure. John, the grass is too damp for you. You had better go and put on your overshoes at once. I am quite comfortable, Caroline, I assure you. You must allow me to be the best judge of that, John. Pray do as I tell you. You spoil him, Caroline, you do indeed. Mrs. Allenby and Lady Studfield enter. Well, oh dear, I hope you like the park. It is said to be well timbered. The trees are wonderful, Lady Hunston. Mm. Quite, quite wonderful. 
But somehow I feel sure that if I lived in the country for six months, I should become so unsophisticated that no one would take the slightest notice of me. I assure you, dear, that the country is not that effect at all. Hmm. Why, it was from Melthorpe, which is only two miles from here, that Lady Belton eloped with Lord Featherdale. Hmm. I think to elope is cowardly. It's running away from danger, and danger has become so rare in modern life. And as far as I can make out, the young women of the present day seem to make it the sole object of their lives to be always playing with fire. <laughs> the one advantage of playing with fire, Lady Caroline, is that one never gets even singed. It is the people who don't know how to play with it who get burned up. Yes, I see that. It is very, very helpful. I don't know how the world would get on with such a theory as that, dear Mrs. Allenby. <laughs> Ah, the world was made for men and not for women. Oh, don't say that, Lady Stutfield. We have a much better time than they have. There are far more things forbidden to us than are forbidden to them. Yes, that is quite, quite true. I, I had not thought of that. Sir John and Mr. Kevill enter. Eh, Mr. Kevill, have you got through your work? I have finished my writing for the day, Lady Hunston. It has been an arduous task. The demands on the time of a public man are very heavy nowadays. Very heavy indeed. And I don't think they meet with adequate recognition. John, have you got your overshoes on? Yes, my love. I think you had better come over here, John. It is more sheltered. I am quite comfortable, Caroline. I think not, John. You had better sit beside me. Sir John rises and goes across. And what have you been writing about this morning, uh, Mr. Kevill? Uh, on the usual subject, Lady Shutfield, on purity. That must be such a very, very interesting thing to write about. Are you in favour of women taking part in politics, Mr. Kettle? Kevill, my love. Kevill. The growing influence of women is the one reassuring thing our political life in our political life, Lady Caroline, women are always on the side of morality, public and private. It is so very, very gratifying to hear you say that. <laughs> ah, yes, the moral qualities in women. That is the important thing. I am afraid, Caroline, that dear Lord Illingworth doesn't value the moral qualities in women as much as he should. The world says that Lord Illingworth is very, very wicked. <laughs> but what world says that, Lady Sutfield? It must be the <laughs> next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everyone I know says that you're very, very wicked. It is perfectly monstrous the way people go about nowadays saying things against one, behind one's back, that are absolutely and entirely true. Dear Lord Illingworth is quite hopeless, Lady Stutfield. I've given up trying to reform him. It would take a public company with a board of directors and a paid secretary to do that. But you have the secretary already, Lord Illingworth, haven't you? Gerald Arbuthnot has told us of his good fortune. It is really most kind of you. He is an admirable young man. And his mother is one of my dearest friends. He's just gone for a walk with our pretty American. She is very pretty, is she not? Far too pretty. These American girls carry off all the good matches. Why can't they stay in their own country? They're always telling us it is the paradise of women. It is, Lady Caroline. That is why, like Eve, they are so extremely anxious to get out of it. <laughs> Who are Miss Worsley's parents? Miss Worsley, Caroline, is an orphan. Her father was a very wealthy millionaire or philanthropist or both, I, I believe, who entertained my son quite hospitably when he visited London. I don't know how he made his money originally. I, I fancy in American dry goods. What are American dry goods? American novels. <laughs> I'm afraid you don't appreciate America, Lord Lillingworth. It is a very remarkable country, especially considering its youth. The youth of America is their oldest tradition. It has been going on now for 300 years. <laughs> to hear them talk, one would imagine they were in their first childhood. As far as civilization goes, they're in their second. Uh, there is undoubtedly a great deal of corruption in American politics. I suppose you allude to that. I wonder. 
politics are in a sad way everywhere, I'm told. They certainly are in England. Dear Mr. Cardew is ruining the country. I wonder Mrs. Cardew allows it. I am sure, Lord Illingworth, you don't think that uneducated people should be allowed to have votes. I think they are the only people who should. <laughs> Do you take no side then in modern politics, Lord Illingworth? One should never take sides in anything, Mr. Kevill. Taking sides is the beginning of sincerity, and earnestness follows shortly afterwards, and the human being becomes a bore. However, the House of Commons really does very little harm. You can't make people good by act of Parliament. That is something. <laughs> you, you cannot deny that the House of Commons has always shown great sympathy with the sufferings of the poor. That is its special vice. That is the special vice of the age. One should sympathize with the joy, the beauty, and the color of life. The less said about life's sores, the better, Mr. Kevill. Uh, still, our East End is a very important problem. Quite so. It is the problem of slavery, and we are trying to solve it by amusing the slaves. Certainly a great deal may be done by means of cheap entertainments, as you say, Lord Illingworth. But dear Dr. Dobney, our rector here, provides with the assistance of his curates really admirable recreations for the poor during the winter. And much good may be done by means of a magic lantern or a missionary or some popular amusement of that kind. I am not at all in favor of amusements for the poor, Jane. Blankets and coals are sufficient. There is too much love of pleasure amongst the upper classes as it is. Health is what we want in modern life. The tone is not healthy, not healthy at all. You are quite right, Lady Caroline. I believe I am usually right. Horrid word, health. Silliest word in our language. <laughs> and one knows so well the popular idea of health. The English country gentleman galloping after a fox. The unspeakable in full pursuit of the... Unedible. <laughs> Are you going, Mrs. Allenby? Just as far as the conservatory. Lord Inlingworth told me this morning that there was an orchid there as beautiful as the seven deadly sins. My dear, I hope there's nothing of the kind. I will certainly speak to the gardener. Mrs. Allenby and Lord Illingworth <laughs> exit. Remarkable type, Mrs. Allenby. She lets her clever tongue run away with her sometimes. Is that the only thing Jane, Mrs. Allenby, allows to run away with her? <laughs> I hope so, Caroline, I'm sure. Lord Alfred enters. Dear Lord Alfred, do join us. You believe good of everyone, Jane. It is a great fault. Oh, do you really, really think, Lady Caroline, that one should believe evil of everyone? I think it is much safer to do so, Lady Stutfield. Until, of course, people are found out to be good. But that requires a great deal of investigation nowadays. But there is so much unkind scandal in modern life. Lord Illingworth remarked to me last night at dinner that the basis of every scandal is an absolutely immoral certainty. Well, Lord Illingworth is, of course... A very brilliant man, but he seems to me to be lacking in that fine faith in the nobility and purity of life, which, which is so important in this century. Yes, uh, quite, quite important, is it not? It gives me the impression of a man who does not appreciate the beauty of our English home life. I would say that he was tainted with his foreign ideas on the subject. <laughs> there is nothing, nothing like the beauty of Home life, is there? <laughs> it is the mainstay of our moral system in England, Lady Stutfield. Without it, we would become like our neighbours. That would be so, so sad, would it not? <laughs> I am afraid, too, that Lord Illingworth regards woman simply as a toy. Now, I have never regarded woman as a toy. Woman is the intellectual helpmeet of a man in public as in private. Without her, we should forget the true ideals. I am so very, very glad to hear you say that. Oh, how very, very charming those gilt-tip cigarettes of yours are, Lord Alfred. They are awfully expensive. I can only afford them when I'm in debt. <laughs> <laughs> it must be terribly, terribly distressing to be in debt. One must have some occupation nowadays. If I hadn't my debts, I shouldn't have anything to think about. <laughs> All the chaps I know are in debt. But don't the people to whom you 
Oh, money give you a great, great deal of annoyance. Oh, no. They write. I don't. <laughs> How very, very strange. <laughs> a letter is delivered to Lady Hunston. Oh, here is a letter, Caroline, from dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. Oh, she won't dine. I'm so sorry. Oh, but she will come in the evening. I'm very pleased indeed. She is one of the sweetest of women. Writes a beautiful hand, too. So large, so firm. Hmm, a little lacking in femininity, Jane. Femininity is the quality I admire most in women. Oh, she's very feminine, Caroline, and so good, too. You should hear what the archdeacon says of her. He regards her as his right hand man and he regards her as his right hand in the parish. Shall we all go in? Lady Satfield, shall we go in to tea? Oh, with pleasure, Lady Hunston. They rise and proceed to go off. Sir John offers to carry Lady Studfield's cloak. John, if you would allow your nephew to look after Lady Stutfield's cloak, you might help me with my work basket. Certainly, my love. Lord Illingworth and Mrs. Allenby enter. Curious thing. Plain women are always jealous of their husbands. Beautiful women never are. Beautiful women never have time. They are always so <laughs> occupied in being jealous of other people's husbands. Hmm. I should have thought Lady Caroline would have grown tired of conjugal anxiety by this time. Sir John is her fourth. So much marriage is certainly not becoming. Hmm. Twenty years of romance makes a woman look like a ruin. <laughs> but twenty years of marriage makes her something like a public building. <laughs> <laughs> Hester and Gerald pass by. Lord Ingworth, everyone has been congratulating me. Uh, Lady Hunston and Lady Caroline and everyone. <laughs> I hope I shall make a good secretary. You will be the pattern secretary, Gerald. <laughs> Hester exits with Gerald. Charming Feral, fellow, Gerald Abuthnut. Oh, he's very nice, very nice indeed. But I can't stand the American young lady. Why? She told me yesterday, and in quite a loud voice too, that she was only 18. It was most annoying. One should never trust a woman who tells one her real age. <laughs> a woman who would tell one that would tell one anything. She's a Puritan besides. Ah, the inexcusable. <laughs> I don't mind plain men being Puritans. It is the only excuse they have for being plain. But she is decidedly pretty. I admire her immensely. What a thoroughly bad man you must be. Why do you call me a bad man? The sort of man who admires innocence. And a bad woman? Oh, the sort of woman a man never gets tired of. You are severe on yourself. <laughs> Define us as a sex. Sphinxes without secrets. Hmm. Does that include the Puritan woman? Do you know, I don't believe in the existence of a Puritan woman. Uh, I don't think there is a woman in the world who wouldn't not be a little bit flattered if one made love to her. Hmm. It is that which makes women so irresistibly adorable. You think there is no woman in the world who would object to being kissed? Very few. Miss Worsley would not let you kiss her. Are you sure? Quite. What do you think she'd do if I kissed her? Hmm. Either marry you or strike you across the face with her glove. What would you do if she struck you across the face with her glove? Fall in love with her, probably. Oh, then it is lucky you're not going to kiss her. Is that a challenge? It is an arrow shot into the air. Don't you know that I always succeed in whatever I try? Hmm. I'm sorry to hear it. We women adore failures. They lean on us. You worship success. You cling to them. We are the laurels to hide their boldness. And they need you always, except at the moment of triumph. They're uninteresting men. How tantalizing you are. <laughs> Lord Illingworth, there is one thing I shall always like you for. Only one thing? And I have so many bad qualities. Oh, don't be too conceited about them. You may lose them as you grow old. I never intend to grow old. But what is this mysterious reason why you will always like me? Hmm. It is that you have never made love to me. I have never done anything else. Really? I have not noticed it. How fortunate. It might have been a tragedy for both of us. Mm, we should each have survived. 
Uh, one can survive everything nowadays except death and live down anything except a good reputation. Have you tried a good reputation? It is one of the many annoyances to which I have never been subjected. It may come. Why do you threaten me? I will tell you when you have kissed the Puritan. A footman enters. Tea is served in the yellow drawing room, my lord. Uh, tell her ladyship we are coming in. Yes, my lord. Shall we go in to tea? Oh, do you like such simple pleasures? I adore simple pleasures. They are the last refuge of the complex. But if you wish, let us stay here. Yes, let us stay here. The book of life begins with a man and a woman in a garden. Hmm, it ends with revelations. You fence divinely, but a button has come off your foil. I, I have still the mask. It makes your eyes lovelier. Thank you. Come. Lord Illingworth sees the letter left on the table, takes it up, and looks at the envelope. What curious handwriting. It reminds me of the handwriting of a woman I, I used to know years ago. Who? Oh, uh, no one. No one in particular. A woman of no importance. He throws the letter down and passes <laughs> up the steps of the terrace with Mrs. Allenby. They smile at each other. The drawing room at Hunston after dinner. Lamps lit. The ladies are seated on sofas. What a comfort it is to have got rid of the men for a little. The annoying thing is that the wretches can be perfectly happy without us. That is why I think it is every woman's duty never to leave them alone for a single moment except during this short breathing space after dinner, without which I believe we poor women would be absolutely worn to shadows. The servants enter and serve coffee. <laughs> worn to shadows, dear? Yes, Lady Hunston. It, it is such a strain keeping men up to the mark. They are always trying to escape from us. It seems to me that it is we who are always trying to escape from them. Men are so very, very heartless. They know their power and use it. What stuff and nonsense all this about men is. The thing to do is to keep men in their proper place. Oh, but what is their proper place, Lady Caroline? Looking after their wives, Mrs. Allenby. Really? And if they're not married? If they are not married, they should be looking after a wife. It's perfectly scandalous, the amount of bachelors who are going about society. There should be a law passed to compel them all to marry within 12 months. Oh, but do you really think, dear Caroline, that legislation would improve matters in any way? I am told that nowadays all the married men live like bachelors and all the bachelors live like married men. I certainly never know one from the other. Well, I suppose the type of husband has completely changed since my young days. I'm bound to state that poor dear Hunston was the most delightful of creatures and good as gold. Oh, my husband is sort of a promissory note. I'm tired of meeting him. But you renew him from time to time, don't you? Oh, no, Lady Caroline. I have only had one husband as yet. I suppose you look upon me as quite an amateur. With your views on life, I wonder you married at all. Mm, so do I. My dear child, I believe you are really very happy in your married life, but that you like to hide your happiness from others. I assure you, I was horribly deceived in earnest. Oh, I hope not, dear. I knew his mother quite well. She was a Stratton, Caroline, one of Lord Crowland's daughters. Victoria Stratton. Ooh. I remember her perfectly. Well, then you should certainly know Ernest, Lady Stratfield. It is only fair to tell you beforehand he has got no conversation at all. I adore silent men. Oh, Ernest isn't silent. He talks the whole time, but he has got no conversation. What he talks about, I don't know. I haven't listened to him for years. But was it something very, very wrong that Mr. Allenby did? Did he become angry with you and say anything that was unkind or true? Well, I will tell you, if you solemnly promise to tell everybody else. Oh, thank you, thank you. I will make a point of repeating it. 
When Ernest and I were engaged, he swore to me positively on his knees that he had never loved anyone before in the whole course of his life. I was very young at the time, so I didn't believe him. I needn't tell you. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, I made no inquiries of any kind till after I had been actually married four or five months. I found out then that what he had told me was perfectly true, and that sort of thing makes a man so absolutely uninteresting. <laughs> <laughs> My dear child, you don't mean to tell me that you won't forgive your husband because he never loved anyone else? But did you ever hear such a thing, Caroline? It is much to be regretted that in our rank of life, the wife should be so persistently frivolous under the impression, apparently, that it is the proper thing to be. Do you know, Lady Caroline, I don't think the frivolity of the wife has ever anything to do with it. More marriages are ruined nowadays by the common sense of the husband than by anything else. <laughs> How can a woman expect it to be expected to be happy with a man who insists on treating her as if she were a perfectly rational being? Yes, the common sense of husbands is certainly most, most oh. trying. But do tell me your conception of the ideal husband. Uh, I think it would be so very, very helpful. The ideal husband? There couldn't be such a thing. The institution is wrong. Uh, the ideal man, then, oh. in his relations to us. He would probably be extremely realistic. Mm. The ideal man. Oh, the ideal man should talk to us as if we were goddesses and treat us as if we were children. He should refuse all our serious requests and gratify every one of our whims. He should always say much more than he means and always mean much more than he says. Well, but uh, how could he do both, dear? He should persistently compromise us in public and treat us with absolute respect when we are alone. And yet, he should be always ready to have a perfectly terrible scene whenever we want one and to become miserably, absolutely miserable at a moment's notice and to overwhelm us with just reproaches in less than 20 minutes and to be positively violent at the end of half an hour and leave us forever at a quarter to eight when we have to go and dress for dinner. And when, after that, one has seen him for really the last time, and he has refused to take back the little things he has given us and promised never to communicate with one again or to write one any foolish letters, he should be perfectly broken-hearted and telegraph to one all day long and send one little note every half hour by a private hansom and dine quite alone at the club so that everyone should know how unhappy he was. And then, if his conduct has been quite irreproachable and he has behaved really badly to him, he should be allowed to admit that he has been entirely in the wrong. And when he has admitted that, it becomes a woman's duty to forgive. And one can do it all over again from the beginning with variations. How clever you are, my dear. You never mean a single word you say. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It has been quite entrancing. I must try and remember it all. Do you think, Mrs. Allenby, I shall ever meet the ideal man or... Are there more than one? There are just four in London, Lady Stutfield. <laughs> oh, my dear. Oh, what has happened? Do tell me. Uh, <clears throat> I had completely forgotten that the American young lady has been in the room all the time. <laughs> I'm afraid some of this clever talk may have shocked her a little. Oh, that will do her so much good. Let us hope she didn't understand much. I think I'd better go over and talk to her. She rises and goes across to Hester Worsley and sits down beside her. Well, yeah. dear Miss Worsley, how quiet you have been in your little corner all this time. I suppose you've been reading a book. There are so many good books here in the library. No, I have been listening to the conversation. You mustn't believe everything that was said, you know, dear. <laughs> I didn't believe any of it. That is quite right, dear. I couldn't believe that any women could really hold such views of life as I have heard tonight from some of your guests. I hear you have such pleasant society in America. I'm afraid in England we have too many artificial social barriers. We don't see as much as we should of the middle and lower classes. In America, we have no lower classes. Really? What a very strange arrangement. 
There are a great many things you haven't got in America, I am told, Miss Worsley. They say you have no ruins and no curiosities. The English aristocracy supply us with our curiosities, Lady Caroline. As for ruins, we are trying to build up something that will last longer than brick or stone. Well, what is that, dear? Oh, uh, yes, uh, an iron exhibition, is it not? At, at that uh, place that has the curious name. Uh, we are trying to build up life, Lady Hunston, on a better, truer, purer basis than life rests on here. This sounds strange to you all, no doubt. How could it sound other than strange? You rich people in England, you don't know how you are living. How could you know? You shut out life from pure society, the gentle and the good. You laugh at the simple and the pure, living as you all do on others and by them. You sneer at self-sacrifice. And if you throw bread to the poor, it is merely to keep them quiet for a season. With all your pomp and wealth and art, you don't know how to live. You don't even know that. You love the beauty that you can see and touch and handle, the beauty that you can destroy and do destroy, but of the unseen beauty of life, the unseen beauty of a higher life, you know nothing. You have lost life's secret. I don't think one should know of these things. It's not very, very nice, is it? My dear Miss Worsley, I thought you liked English society so much. You were such a success in it, and you were so much admired by the best people. I quite forget what Lord Henry Weston said of you, but it was most complimentary, and you know what an absolute authority he is on beauty. Lord Henry Weston. I remember him, Lady Hunston. A man with a hideous smile and a hideous past. He has asked everywhere. No dinner party is complete without him. What of those whose ruin is due to him? They are outcasts. They are nameless. If you met them in the street, you would turn your head away. I don't complain of their punishment. Let all women who have sinned be punished. Mrs. Arbuthnot enters from the terrace in a cloak with a lace veil over her head. She hears the last words and starts. My dear young lady. It is right that they should be punished, but don't let them be the only ones to suffer. If a man and woman have sinned, let them both go forth into the desert to love or loathe each other there. Let them both be branded. Set a mark, if you wish, on each, but don't punish the one and let the other go free. Don't have one law for men and another for women. Might I, dear Miss Worsley, as you are standing up, ask you for my cotton that is just behind you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, I am so pleased you have come up, but I didn't hear you announce. Oh, I came straight in from the terrace, Lady Hunston, just as I was. You didn't tell me you had a party. Oh, not a party. Only a few guests who are staying in the house and whom you must know. Caroline, this is Mrs. Arbuthnot, one of my sweetest friends. Lady Caroline Pontefract, Lady Statfield, Mrs. Allenby, and my young American friend, Miss Worsley, who has just been telling us all how wicked we are. Mm -hmm. I am afraid you think I spoke too strongly, Lady Hunston, but there are some things in England which really My should... My dear young lady, there was a great deal of truth, I dare say, in what you said, and you looked very pretty while you said it, which is much more important, Lord Illingworth would tell us. The only point where I thought you were a little hard was about Lady Caroline's brother, about poor Lord Henry. He is really such good company. Lady Caroline, I had no idea it was your brother. I am sorry for the pain I must have caused you. I, I, My dear Miss Worsley, the only part of your little speech, if I may so term it, with which I thoroughly agreed, was the part about my brother. Nothing that you could possibly say could be too bad for him. I regard Henry as infamous, absolutely infamous, but I am bound to state, as you were remarking, Jane, that he is excellent company, and he has one of the best cooks in London. And after a good dinner, one can forgive anybody, even one's own relations. Now, do come, dear, and make friends with Mrs. Arbuthnot. She is one of the good, sweet, simple people you told us we never admitted into society. I am sorry to say Mrs. Arbuthnot comes very rarely to me, but that is not my fault. Oh, what a bore it is, the men staying so long after dinner. I expect they are saying the most dreadful things about us. How very, very horrid of them. 
<laughs> Shall we go on the terrace? Uh, anything to get away from the dowagers and the dowdies. Uh, we are only going to look at the stars, Lady Hunston. Oh, you will find a great many, dear, a great many. But don't catch cold. We shall all miss Gerald so much, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. But has Lord Illingworth really offered to make Gerald his secretary? Oh, yes, he has been most charming about it. He has the highest possible opinion of your boy. You don't know Lord Illingworth, I believe, dear. I have never met him. You know him by name, no doubt. I'm afraid I don't. I live so much out of the world and see so few people. I remember hearing years ago of an old Lord Illingworth who lived in Yorkshire, I think. Yes, yes, that, that would be the last Earl but one. He was a very curious man. He wanted to marry beneath him, well, or, or wouldn't, I believe. Uh, there was some scandal about it. The present Lord Illingworth is quite different. Of course, he is comparatively a ma young man still, and he has only come to his title within... Uh, how long exactly is it, Caroline, since Lord Illingworth succeeded? About four years, I think, Jane. I know it was the same year in which my brother had his last exposure in the evening newspapers. Ah, I remember. That would be about four years ago. Of course, there was a great many people between the present Lord Illingworth and the title, Mrs. Arbuthnot. There was, uh, who was there? Carolina? Uh, uh, there was poor Margaret's baby. You remember how anxious she was to have a boy. And it was a boy, but it died. And her husband died shortly afterwards. And she married almost immediately one of Lord Ascot's sons, who, I am told, beats her. Ah, that is in the family, dear, that is in the family. And there was also, I remember, a clergyman who wanted to be a lunatic. No, oh, uh, no, a lunatic who wanted to be a clergyman. I forget which, but but I know the Court of Chancery investigated the matter and decided that he was quite sane. Uh, and, and I saw him afterwards at poor Lord Plumstead's with straws in his hair or, or something very odd about him. Can't recall what. I only regret, Lady Caroline, that dear Lady Cecilia never lived to see her son get the title. Lady Cecilia? Lord Illingworth's mother, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, was one of the Duchess of Jerningham's pretty daughters, but she married Sir Thomas Harford, who wasn't considered a very good match for her at the time, though he was said to be the handsomest man in London. I knew them all quite intimately, and both the sons, Arthur and George. It was the eldest son who succeeded, of course, Lady Hunston? No, no, dear, he was killed in the hunting field. Well, was it fishing? Caroline, I forget. But uh, no, George came in for everything. I, I always tell him that no younger son has ever had such good luck as he has had. Uh, Lady Hunston, I want to speak to Gerald at once. Might I see him? Can he oh, be sir? sent for? Certainly, dear. I, I will send one of the servants into the dining room to fetch him. I don't know what keeps the gentleman so long. When I knew Lord Illingworth first as plain George Hartford, he was simply a very brilliant young man about town, with not a penny of money except what poor dear Lady Cecilia gave him. She was quite devoted to him, chiefly, I fancy, because he was on bad terms with his father. Oh, here's the dear Archdeacon! Sir John and Dr. Daubeny enter. Sir John goes over to Lady Stutfield. Dr. Daubeny to Lady Hunston. Lord Illingworth has been most entertaining. I have never enjoyed myself more. <gasps> Mrs. Arbuthnot. You see, I have got Mrs. Arbuthnot to come to me at last. That is a great honor, Lady Hunston. Mrs. Daubeny will be quite jealous of you. I am so sorry, Mrs. Daubeny could not come with you tonight. Headache as usual, I suppose. Yes, Lady Hunston, a perfect martyr. But she is happiest alone. She is happiest alone. John! Sir John goes over to his wife. Dr. Daubeny talks to Lady Hunston and Mrs. Arbuthnot. Mrs. Arbuthnot watches Lord Illingworth the whole time. He has passed across the room without noticing her and approaches Mrs. Allenby, who, with Lady Stutfield, is standing by the door looking onto the terrace. How is the most charming woman in the world? But what a short time you've been in the dining room. It seems as if we had only just left. I was bored to death. Never opened my lips the whole time. Absolutely longing to come into you. Oh, you should have. The American girl has been giving us a lecture. 
Really? What did she lecture about? Oh, puritanism, of course. I'm going to convert her, am I not? How long do you give me? A week. A week is more than enough. <laughs> Gerald enters. Your mother! Gerald, I don't feel well at all. See me home, Gerald. I shouldn't have come. Oh, I am so sorry, Mother, certainly. But you must know Lord Illingworth first. Uh, not tonight, Gerald. Uh, Lord Illingworth, I want you so much to meet my mother. With the greatest pleasure. I'll be back in a moment. People's mothers always bore me to death. All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That is his. What a delightful mood you are in mm -hmm. tonight. Lord Illingworth turns round and goes across with Gerald to Mrs. Arbuthnot. When he sees her, he starts back in wonder. Then slowly his eyes turn toward Gerald. Mother, this is Lord Illingworth, who has offered to take me as his private secretary. You'll thank Lord Illingworth, Mother, won't you? Lord Illingworth is very good, I'm sure, to interest himself in you for the moment. Oh, uh, Gerald and I are great friends already, Mrs. Arbuthnot. There can be nothing in common between you and my son, Lord Illingworth. But, dear mother, how can you say so? Of course, Lord Illingworth is awfully clever in that sort of thing, but there's nothing Lord Illingworth doesn't know. My dear boy. He knows more about life than anyone I have ever met. I feel an awful duffer when I am with you, Lord Illingworth. Of course, I, I have so few advantages. I have not been to Eton or Oxford like other chaps, but Lord Illingworth doesn't seem to mind that. He has been awfully good to me, Mother. Lord Illingworth may change his mind. He may not really want you as his secretary. Mother! You must remember, as you said yourself, you've had so few advantages. Lord Illingworth, I want to speak to you for a moment. Do come over. Will you excuse me, Mrs. Abusnut? Now, don't let your charming mother make any more difficulties, Gerald. The thing is quite settled, isn't it? I hope so. Well, Caroline, shall we all make a move to the music room? Miss Worsley is going to play. You come too, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, won't you? You don't know what a treat is in store for you. Dr. Daubeny, I must really take Mrs. Wor Miss Worsley down some afternoon to the rectory. I should so much like dear Mrs. Daubeny to hear her on the violin. Uh, I forgot. Dear Mrs. Daubeny's hearing is a little defective, is it not? Her deafness is a great, great privation to her. She can't even hear my sermons now. She reads them at home. But she has many resources in herself, many resources. She reads a good deal, I suppose. Just the very largest print. The eyesight is rapidly going, but she's never morbid, never morbid. Do speak to my mother, Lord Illingworth, before you go into the music room. She seems to think somehow you, you don't mean what you say to me. Aren't you coming? In a few moments. Lady Hunston, if Mrs. Arbuthnot would allow me, I would like to say a few words to her and we'll join you later on. Oh, of course. You'll have a great deal to say to her and she will have a great deal to thank you for. It is not every son who gets such an offer, Mrs. Arbuthnot. But I know you appreciate that, dear. John! Now, don't keep Mrs. Arbuthnot too long, Lord Illingworth. We can't spare her. She exits following the other guests. So, that is our son, Rachel. Well, I am very proud of him. He is a Harford, every inch of him. By the way, why Arbuthnot, Rachel? One name is as good as another, when one has no right to any name. Well, Rachel, what is over is over, and all I've got to say now is that I am very, very much pleased with our boy. The world will know him merely as my private secretary, but to me, he will be something very near and very dear. <laughs> it's a curious thing, Rachel. My life seemed to be quite complete. It was not so. It lacked something. It lacked a son. I have found my son now. I am glad to have found him. You have no right to claim him or the smallest part of him. 
The boy is entirely mine and shall remain mine. My dear Rachel, you have had him to yourself for over 20 years. Why not let me have him for a little now? He is quite as much mine as he is yours. Are you talking of the child you abandoned? Of the child who, as far as you were concerned, might have died of hunger and of want? You forget, Rachel. It was you who left me. It was not I who left you. I left you because you refused to give the child a name. Before my son was born, I implored you to marry me. I had no expectations then. And besides, Rachel, I wasn't much older than you were. I was 21, I believe, when the whole thing began in your father's garden. When a man is old enough to do wrong, he should be old enough to do right also. My dear Rachel, intellectual generalities are always interesting, but generalities in morals mean absolutely nothing. As for saying I left our child to starve, that, of course, is untrue and silly. My mother offered you 600 a year, but you wouldn't take anything. You simply disappeared and carried the child away with you. I wouldn't have accepted a penny from her. Your father was different. He told you in my presence when we were in Paris that it was your duty to marry me. Oh, duty is what one expects from others. It is not what one does oneself. Of course I was influenced by my mother. Every man is when he is young. I am glad to hear you say so. Gerald shall certainly not go away with you. What nonsense, Rachel. Do you think I would allow my son... Our to, son! My son to go with the man who spoiled my youth, who ruined my life, who has tainted every moment of my days. You don't realize what my past has been in suffering and in shame. My dear Rachel, I must candidly say that I think Gerald's future considerably more important than your past. Gerald cannot separate his future from my past. That is exactly what he should do. That is exactly what you should help him to do. <laughs> what a typical woman you are. You talk sentimentally and you are thoroughly selfish the whole time. But don't let's have a scene. Rachel, I want you to look at this matter from the common sense point of view, from the point of view of what is best for our son, leaving you and me out of the question. What is our son at present? An underpaid clerk in a small provincial bank in a third-rate English town. If you imagine he is quite happy in such a position, you are mistaken. He is thoroughly discontented. He was not discontented until he met you. You have made him so. Of course I made him so. Discontent is the first step in the progress of a man or a nation. But I did not leave him with a mere longing for things he could not get. No, I made him a charming offer. He jumped at it. I need hardly say any young man would. And now, simply because it turns out that I am the boy's own father, and he my own son, you propose practically to ruin his career? That is to say, if I were a perfect stranger, you would allow Gerald to go away with me. But as he is my own flesh and blood, you won't. Oh, how utterly illogical you are. I will not allow him to go. How can you prevent it? What excuse can you give to him for making him decline such an offer as mine? I won't tell him in what relation I stand him, and I need hardly say. But you daren't tell him. You know that. Look at how you brought him up. I have brought him up to be a good man. Quite so. And what is the result? You have educated him to be your judge if he ever finds you out, and a bitter and unjust judge he will be to you. Don't be deceived, Rachel. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. George, don't take my son away from me. I have had 20 years of sorrow. And I have had only one thing to love me, only one thing to love. You have had a life of joy and pleasure and success. Don't come now and rob me of, of all I have in the whole world. You are so rich in other things. George, don't take Gerald from me. Rachel, at the present moment, you are not necessary to Gerald's career. I am there is nothing more to be said on the subject. I will not let him go. Here is Gerald. He has a right to decide for himself. Gerald enters. Well, dear mother, I, I hope you have settled it all with Lord Illingworth. I have not, Gerald. Your mother seems not to like you coming with me for some reason. Why, mother? 
I thought you were quite happy here with me, Gerald. I didn't know you were so anxious to leave me. Mother, how can you talk like that? I thought you would have been proud to see me, Lord Illingworth's secretary. I do not think it would be suitable as a... I do not think you would be suitable as a private secretary to Lord Illingworth. You have no qualifications. I don't wish to seem to interfere for a moment, Mrs. Abuthnot. But as far as your last objection is concerned, I surely am the best judge. And I can only tell you that your son has all the qualifications I had hoped for. He has more, in fact, than I had ever thought of. Far more. Uh, have you any other reason, Mrs. Abusnut, why you don't wish your son to accept this post? Have you, mother? Do answer. If you have, Mrs. Abusnut, pray, pray say it. We are quite by ourselves here. Whatever it is, I need not say, I will not repeat it. Mother. If you would like to be alone with your son, I will leave you. You may have some other reason you don't wish me to hear. I have no other reason. Then, my dear boy, we may look on things as settled. Come, you and I will smoke a cigarette on the terrace together. And Mrs. Abbasnut, pray let me tell you that I think you have acted very, very wisely. Mrs. Arbuthnot is left alone. The Picture Gallery at Hunston. A door at the back leads on to a terrace. Lord Illingworth reclines in a sofa, Gerald in a chair. There any sensible woman, your mother, Gerald. I knew she would come round in the end. My mother's awfully conscientious, Lord Illingworth, and I know she doesn't think I am educated enough to be your secretary. And she's perfectly right, too. I, I was fearfully idle when I was at school, and I couldn't pass an examination now to save my life. Don't be afraid, Gerald. Remember that you've got on your side the most wonderful thing in the world, youth. Ah, to win back my youth, Gerald, there's nothing I wouldn't do except take exercise, get up early, or be a useful member of the community. Uh, but you don't call yourself old, Lord Illingworth. I am old enough to be your father, Gerald. I, I don't remember my father. He died years ago. So Lady Hunston told me. It is very curious. My mother never talks to me about my father. I sometimes think she might have married beneath her. Really? You have missed not having a father, I suppose, Gerald? Uh, no, uh, my mother has been so good to me. No one ever has such a mother as I've had. I suppose your mother is very religious and that sort of thing. Oh, yes, she's, she's always going to church. Ah, she is not modern. And to be modern is the only thing worth being nowadays. You want to be modern, don't you, Gerald? You want to know life as it really is? not to be put up with any old-fashioned theories about life. Well, what you have to do at present is simply fit yourself for the best society. A man who can dominate a London dinner table can dominate the world. Uh, by the way, Gerald, you should learn how to tie your tie better. A sentiment is all very well for the buttonhole, but the essential thing for a necktie is style. A well-tied tie is the first serious step in life. I, I might be able to learn how to, how to tie a tie, Lord Illingworth, but I should never be able to talk as you do. I, I, don't, I don't know how to talk. Oh, talk to every woman as if you loved her and to every man as if he bored you. And at the end of your first season, you will have the reputation of possessing the most perfect social tact. But it is very difficult to get into society, isn't it? To get into the best societies nowadays, one has either to feed people, amuse people, or shock people. That is all. <laughs> I suppose society is it's a wonderful thing. To be in it is merely a bore, but to be out of it, simply a tragedy. Society is a necessary thing. No man has any real success in the world unless he has got a woman to back him. And women rule society. 
If you have not got a woman on your side, then you are quite over. You might just as well be a barrister or a stockbroker or a journalist at once. It is very difficult to understand women, is it not? You should never try to understand them. Women are pictures. Men are problems. <laughs> if you want to know what woman really means, which, by the way, is always a dangerous thing to do, look at her. Don't listen to her. But women are awfully clever, aren't they? One should always tell them so. But the philosopher, my dear Gerald, women represent the triumph of matter over mind, just as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. How, then, can women have so much power as you say they have? The history of women is the history of the worst form of tyranny the world has ever known, the tyranny of the weak over the strong. It is the only tyranny that lasts. You have never been married, Lord Illingworth, have you? Men marry because they are tired. Women because they are curious. Both are disappointed. But, but you don't think one can be happy when one is married? Perfectly happy. But the happiness of a married man, my dear Gerald, depends on the people he has not married. But if one is in love... One should always be in love. That is the reason one should never marry. Love is a very wonderful thing, isn't it? When one is in love, one begins by deceiving oneself, and one ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls a romance. But a really grand passion is comparatively rare nowadays. It is the privilege of people who have nothing to do. That is one use of the idle classes in a country, and the only possible explanation of us Harfords. Harfords, Lord Illingworth? And that is my family name. You <laughs> should study the peerage, Gerald. It is the one book a young man about town should know thoroughly, and it is the best thing in fiction that England has ever produced. <laughs> and now, Gerald, you are going into a perfectly new life with me, and I want you to know how to live. For the world has been made by fools that the wise men should live it. Mrs. Arbuthnot appears on the terrace. Lady Hunston and Dr. Daubeny enter. Ah, here you are, dear Lord Illingworth. Well, I suppose you have been telling our young friend Gerald what his new duties are to be and giving him a great deal of good advice over a pleasant cigarette. I have been giving him the best of advice, Lady Hunston, and the best of cigarettes. I am so sorry I was not here to listen to you, but I suppose I am too old now to learn. Except from you, dear Archdeacon, when you are in your nice pulpit. But then I always know what you are going to say, so I don't feel alarmed. Ah, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, do come join us. Come, dear. Gerald has been having such a long talk with Lord Illingworth. I am sure you must feel very much flattered at the pleasant way in which everything has turned out for him. Let us sit down. Now, what are you talking about, Lord Illingworth? Do tell us. I was on the point of explaining to Gerald that the world has always laughed at its own tragedies, that being the only way in which it has been able to bear them, and that consequently, whatever the world has treated seriously belongs to the comedy side of things. Now, I am quite out of my depth. I usually am when Lord Willingworth says anything. You and I, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, are behind the age. We can't follow Lord Illingworth. I should be sorry to follow Lord Illingworth in any of his opinions. You are quite right, dear. Lady Caroline enters. Jane, have you seen John anywhere? You needn't be anxious about him, dear. He is with Lady Stutfield. I saw them some time ago in the yellow drawing room. They seem quite happy together. Well, you're, you're not going, Caroline. Pray sit down. I think I had better look after John. Lady Caroline exits. Oh, it doesn't do to pay men so much attention. And Caroline really has nothing to be anxious about. Lady Stutfield is very sympathetic. She's just as sympathetic about one thing as she is about another. A beautiful nature. Sir John and Mrs. Allenby enter. Ah, here is Sir John, and with Mrs. Allenby too. Sir John Caroline has been looking everywhere for you. We've been waiting for her in the music room, dear Lady Hunston. Ah, the music room, of course. I thought it was the yellow drawing room. My memory is getting so defective. 
Mrs. Daubeny has a wonderful memory, hasn't she? She used to be quite remarkable for her memory, but since her last attack, uh, she recalls chiefly the events of her early childhood. But she finds great pleasure in such retrospections. Great pleasure. Lady Stutfield and Mr. Kevill enter. Ah, dear Lady Stutfield, and what has Mr. Kevill been talking to you about? About bimetallism, as well as I remember. Bimetallism. Is that quite a nice subject? However, I, I know people discuss everything very freely nowadays. What did Sir John talk to you about, dear Mrs. Allenby? He has been most interesting on the subject of Patagonia. Savages seem to have quite the same views as cultured, pe cultured people on almost all subjects. They're all excessively advanced. What do they do? Apparently everything. Well... It is very gratifying, dear Archdeacon, is it not, to find that human nature is permanently one. On the whole, the world is the same world, is it not? The world is simply divided into two classes, those who believe the incredible, like the public, and those who do the improbable. Like yourself? Yes, I am always astonishing myself. It is the only thing that makes life worth living. And what have you been doing lately that astonishes you? I have been discovering all kinds of beautiful qualities in my own nature. Ah, don't, qu don't become quite perfect all at once. Do it gradually. I don't intend to grow perfect at all. At least I hope I shan't. It would be the most inconvenient. Women love us for our defects. If we have enough of them, they will forgive us everything, even our gigantic intellects. Ah, we women should forgive everything, shouldn't we, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot? I am sure you agree with me in that. I do not, Lady Hunston. I think there are many things women should never forgive. What sort of things? The ruin of another woman's life? Ah, uh, those things are very sad, no doubt, but I believe there are admirable homes where people of that kind are looked after and reformed. And I think on the whole that the secret of life is to take things very, very easily. The secret of life is to never have an emotion that is unbecoming. The secret of life is to appreciate the pleasure of being terribly, terribly deceived. The secret of life is to resist temptation. Lady Stutfield. There is no secret of life. Life's aim, if it has one, is simply to be always looking for temptations. There are not nearly enough. I sometimes pass a whole day without coming across a single one. It is quite dreadful. It makes one so nervous about the future. I don't know how it is, dear Lord Illingworth, but everything you have said today to me seems excessively immoral. It has been most interesting listening to you. All thought is immoral. It's the very essence is destruction. If you think of anything, you kill it. Nothing survives being thought of. I don't understand a word, Lord Illingworth, but I have no doubt it is all quite true. Personally, I have very little to propose. I have very little to reproach myself with on the score of thinking. I don't believe in women thinking too much. Women should think in moderation, as they should do all things in moderation. Moderation is a fatal thing, Lady Hunston. Nothing succeeds like excess. I hope I shall remember that. Sounds an admirable maxim, but I'm beginning to forget everything. It's a great misfortune. It is one of your most fascinating qualities, Lady Hunston. No woman should have a memory. Memory in a woman is the beginning of dowdiness. One can always tell from a woman's bonnet whether she has got a memory or not. <laughs> How charming you are, dear Lord Illingworth. You always find out that one's most glaring fault is one's most important virtue. You have the most comforting views of life. Farquhar enters. Dr. Daubeny's carriage. My dear Archdeacon, it is only half past ten. I'm afraid I must go, Lady Hunston. Tuesday is always one of Mrs. Daubney's bad nights. Well, I won't keep you from her. I have told Farquhar to put a brace of partridge in the carriage. Mrs. Daubney may fancy them. It is very kind of you, but Mrs. Daubney never touches solids now. Lives entirely on jellies. But she is wonderfully cheerful, wonderfully cheerful. She has nothing to complain of. 
he exits with Lady Hunston. Sir John, Lady Studfield, Mr. Kevil, and Lord Alfred also exit. There is a beautiful moon tonight. Let us go and look at it. To look at anything that is inconstant is charming nowadays. You have your looking glass. It is unkind. It merely shows me my wrinkles. Mine is better behaved. It never tells me the truth. Then it is in love with you. (laughs) Lord Illingworth exits with Mrs. Allenby. It's getting late, Gerald. Let us go home. If you really want to, of course, Mother. But I must bid goodbye to Lord Illingworth first. I'll be back in five minutes. Let him leave if he chooses. Not with him. Not with him. Couldn't bear it. Hester enters. What a lovely night it is, Mrs. Arbuthnet. Is it? Mrs. Arbuthnot, I wish you would let us be friends. You are so different from the other women here. When you came into the drawing room this evening, somehow you brought with you a sense of what is good and pure in life. I have been foolish. There are things that are right to say, but may be said at the wrong time and to the wrong people. I heard what you said, and I agree with it, Miss Worsley. I didn't know you had heard it, but I knew you would agree with me. A woman who has sinned should be punished, shouldn't she? Yes. She shouldn't be allowed to come into society of good men and women? She should not. And the men should be punished in the same way? In the same way. And the children, if there are children, in the same way also? Yes, it is right that the sins of the parents should be visited on the children. It is a just law. It is God's law. It is one of God's terrible laws. You are distressed about your son leaving you, Mrs. Arbuthnot? He has his heart set on going. He couldn't refuse you anything. He loves you too much. Ask him to stay. Let me send him in to you. He is on the terrace at this moment with Lord Illingworth. Do, do ask him to stay. Hester exits. He won't come. I know he won't come. Gerald enters. Dear mother, I I am afraid I kept you waiting. I I forgot all about it. I am so happy tonight, mother. I I have never been so happy. Gerald, don't go away with Lord Illingworth. I implore you not to. Gerald, I beg you. Mother, how changeable you are. An hour and a half ago in the drawing room, you agreed to the whole thing. Now you return around and and make objections and and try to force me to give up on my one chance at life. It is very strange that when I have had such a wonderful piece of good luck, the one person to put difficulty in my way should should be my own mother. Uh, Besides, you know, mother, I love Hester Worsley. And if I had a position, if I had a prospect, I could... I could ask her to, don't you see, don't you understand, Mother, what it means to me to be Lord Illingworth's secretary? I fear you have no hopes of Miss Worsley. I know her views on life. She has just told them to me. Then I have my ambition left, at any rate. That is something. I am glad I have that. You have always tried to crush my ambition, Mother. Haven't you? I think success is is a thing worth having. You have been wrong in all that you have taught me, Mother. Quite wrong. Lord Illingworth is a successful man. He is a fashionable man. He is a man who lives in in the world and, and for it. Well, I would give anything to be just like Lord Illingworth. I would sooner see you dead. Mother, what is your objection to Lord Illingworth? Tell me, tell me right out, what is it? He is a bad man. I suppose you think him bad because he doesn't believe the same things as you do. Well, men are different from women, Mother. It is natural that he should have different views. It is not what Lord Illingworth believes or what he does not believe that makes him bad. It is what he is. Mother, 
is it something you you know of him? Something you actually know? It is something I know. How long have you known it? For 20 years. Is it fair to go back 20 years in any man's career? And what have you or I to do with Lord Illingworth's early life? And what business is it of ours? What this man has been, he is now. And he will always be. Mother, tell me what Lord Illingworth did. If he did anything shameful, I will not go away with him. I mean, surely you know me well enough for that. Gerald, come. Come near to me. Quite close to me. As you used to do when you were a little boy. When you were mother's own boy. Gerald sits down beside his mother. She runs her fingers through his hair and strokes his hands. Gerald, there was a girl once. She was very young. She was a little over 18 at the time. George Harford. That was Lord Illingworth's name then. George Harford met her. She knew nothing about life. He knew everything. He made this girl love him. He made her love him so much that she left her father's house with him one morning. He had solemnly promised to marry her and she had believed him. But he put the marriage off from week to week and month to month. She trusted him all the while. She loved him. Before her child was born, before she had a child, she implored him for the child's sake to marry her, that the child might have a name, that her sin might not be visited on the child who was innocent. He refused. After the child was born, she left him, taking the child away, and her life was ruined, and her soul was ruined, and all that was sweet and good and pure in her ruined also. She suffered terribly. She suffers now. She will always suffer. For her, there is no joy, no peace, no atonement. The fire cannot purify her. The waters cannot quench her anguish. Nothing can heal her. No anodyne can give her sleep. No poppies, forgetfulness. She is lost. She is a lost soul. That is why I call Lord Illingworth a bad man. And that is why I don't want my boy to be with him. My dear mother, it, it all sounds very tragic, of course. But I dare say the girl was just as much to blame as Lord Illingworth was. After all, would a, a really nice girl, a girl with any nice feelings at all, go away from her home with a man to whom she was not married yeah. and live with him as his wife. No nice girl would. Gerald, I withdraw all my objections. You are at liberty to go away with Lord Illingworth when and where you choose. Dear mother, I knew you wouldn't stand in my way. You are the best woman God ever made. And as for Lord Illingworth, I, I don't believe he is capable of anything infamous or base. I, I can't believe it of him. I, I, I can't. Let me go. Let me go. Hester enters in terror and rushes over to Gerald and flings herself in his arms. Don't save me. Save me from him. From whom? He has insulted me. Horribly insulted me. Save me. Who? Who has dead? Lord Illingworth enters. Hester breaks from Gerald's arms and points to him. Lord Illingworth, you have insulted the, the purest thing on God's earth, a, a thing as pure as my own mother. You have insulted the woman I love most in the world with my own mother. As there is a God in heaven, I will kill you. No, no. Don't hold me, mother. Don't hold me. I will kill him. Gerald. Let me go, I say. Stop, Gerald, stop. He is your own father. Gerald clutches his mother's hands and looks into her face. 
She sinks slowly on the ground in shame. Hester steals toward the door. Lord Illingworth bites his lip. After a time, Gerald raises his mother up, puts his arm around her, and leads her from the room. The sitting room at Mrs. Arbuthnot's. There is a large open French window at the back, looking onto the garden. Gerald is writing at a table. Alice escorts in Lady Hunston and Mrs. Allenby. Lady Hunston and Mrs. Allenby. Good morning, Gerald. Good morning, Lady Hunston. Good morning, Mrs. Allenby. We came to inquire for your dear mother, Gerald. I hope she is better. Uh, my mother has not come down yet, Lady Hunston. Ah, I am afraid the heat was too much for her last night. One feels your mother's good influence in everything she has about her, Gerald. Lord Illingworth says that all influence is bad, but that a good influence is the worst in the world. When Lord Illingworth knows Mrs. Arbuthnot better, he will change his mind. I must certainly bring him here. Most women in London nowadays seem to furnish their rooms with nothing but orchids, foreigners, and French novels. But here we have the room of a sweet saint. Fresh natural flowers, books that don't shock one, pictures that one can look at without blushing. But I like blushing. Well, there is a good deal to be said for blushing if one can do it at the proper moment. By the by, Gerald, I hope your dear mother will come and see me more often now. You and Lord Illingworth start almost immediately, don't you? I have given up my intention of being Lord Illingworth's secretary. Surely not, Gerald. It would be most unwise of you. What reason can you have? I don't wish to leave my mother. Well, now, Gerald, that is pure laziness on your part. Not to leave your mother... If I were your mother, I would insist on you going. Alice enters. Mrs. Arbuthnot compliments my lady, but she has a bad headache and cannot see anyone this morning. A bad headache? I'm so sorry. Perhaps you'll bring her up to Hunston this afternoon if she is better, Gerald? I'm afraid not this afternoon, Lady Hunston. Well, tomorrow then. Oh, if you had a father, Gerald, he wouldn't let you waste your life here. He would send you off with Lord Illingworth at once. But mothers are so weak, they give up to their sons in everything. We're all heart, all heart. Goodbye, Gerald. Give my fondest love to your mother. Goodbye, Mr. Arbuthnot. Goodbye. Gerald sits down and reads over his letter. What name can I sign? I, who have no right to any name. Gerald signs his name, puts the letter into the envelope, addresses it, and is about to seal it when Mrs. Arbuthnot enters. Gerald lays down sealing wax. Mother, I have just written to him. To whom? To my father. I, I have written to tell him to come here at four o'clock this afternoon. Gerald. If you are going away with Lord Illingworth, go at once. Go before it kills me. But don't ask me to meet him. Mother, you don't understand. Nothing in the world would induce me to go away with Lord Illingworth or to leave you. Surely you know me well enough for that. No. I have written to say to him that he must marry you. Marry me? I will insist upon him doing it. I will make him do it. He will not dare refuse. But, Gerald, it is I who refuse. But you don't understand. It is for your sake I am talking, and not, not for mine. This marriage will not help me, will not give me a name that will really, rightly, be mine to bear. But surely it will be something for you, that, that you, my mother, should however late, become the wife of the man who is my father. Will that not be something? I will not marry him. Mother, you must. I will not. What atonement can be made of me? There is no atonement possible. I am disgraced. He is not. That is all. 
It is the usual history of a man, and the ending is the ordinary ending. The woman suffers, the man goes free. I don't know if that is the ordinary ending, mother. I hope it is not. But your life, at any rate, shall not end like that. The man shall make whatever repartation is possible. It is not enough. It does not wipe out the past. I know that. But at least it makes the future better. Better for you, ma. I refuse to marry Lord Illingworth. If he came to you himself and asked you to be his wife, you, you would give him a different answer. I mean, remember, he is my father. If he came to me himself, which he will not do, my answer would be the same. Remember that I am your mother. Mother, you make it terribly difficult for me by talking like that. And I can't understand why you won't look at this matter from the right, from the, the only proper standpoint. It is a duty that you owe, not merely to yourself, but to all women. Yes, to all the other women in the world, lest he betray more. I owe nothing to other women. There is not one of them to help me. Women are hard on each other. That girl, last night, good though she is, fled from the room as though I were a tainted thing. She was right. I am a tainted thing, but my wrongs are my own, and I will bear them alone. Hester enters unseen. I implore you to do what I ask. What son has ever asked of his mother to make so hideous a sacrifice? None. Well, what mother has ever refused to marry the father of her own child? None. Let me be the first, then. I will not do it. Mother... Okay, you, you believe in religion, and you brought me up to believe in it also. Well, surely your religion, the religion that you taught me when I was a boy, mother, must tell you that I am right. You know it, you feel it. I will never stand before God's altar and ask God's blessing on so hideous a mockery as a marriage between me and George Harford. I don't understand you now. Men don't understand what mothers are. I am no different from other women except in the wrong done me and the wrong I did. Yet to bear you, I had to look on death. Death fought me for you. And you needed love, for you were weakly. And only love could have kept you alive. Only love can keep anyone alive. And boys are careless often and without thinking give pain. And we always fancy that when they come to a man's estate to know us better, they'll repay us. But it is not so. The world draws them from our side and they make friends and have amusements from which we are barred and interests that are not ours. You made many friends and went into their houses and were glad with them. And I, knowing my secret, did not dare to follow. What should I have done? in honest households. My past was ever with me. And you thought I didn't care for the pleasant things of life. I tell you, I longed for them, but I did not dare touch them feeling I had no right. You thought I was happier working amongst the poor. That was my mission, you imagined. It was not, but where else was I to go? The sick do not ask if the hand that smooths their pillow is pure, nor the dying care if the lips that touch their brow have known the kiss of sin. Had you thought I spent too much time in going to church and on church duties, but where else was I to turn? God's house is the only house where sinners are made welcome, and you were always in my heart, Gerald, too much in my heart. For though day after day, at morn and even song, I have knelt in God's house, I have never repented of my sin. How could I repent of my sin when you, my love, were its fruit? I would rather be your mother, oh, much rather than have been always pure. Don't you see? Don't you understand? It is my dishonor that has made you so dear to me. 
It is my disgrace that has bound you so closely to me. Oh, don't ask me to do this horrible thing. Child of mine, child of my shame, be still the child of my shame. Oh, mother, I didn't know you loved me so much as that. And I will be a better son to you than I have ever been. But mother, I can't help it. You must become my father's wife. You must marry him. It is your duty. No, no, you shall not. That would be real dishonor, the first you have ever known. That would be real disgrace, the first to touch you. Leave him and come with me. There are other countries than England. Oh, other countries overseas, better, wiser, and less unjust lands. The world is very wide and very big. Esther. Don't, don't. You cannot love me at all unless you love her also. You cannot honor me unless she is holier to you. In her, all womanhood is martyred. Not she alone, but all of us are stricken in her house. Esther. Hester, what shall I do? Do you respect the man who is your father? Respect him? I, I despise him. He is infamous. I thank you for saving me from him last night. That, that is nothing. I, I would die to save you. But you don't, you don't tell me what to do now. Have I not thanked you for saving me? But what should I do? <laughs> Ask your own heart, not mine. I never had a mother to save or shame. He is hard. He is hard. Let me go away. Mother, mother, forgive me. I, I have been to blame. Don't kiss my hands. They are cold. My heart is cold. Something has broken it. Don't say that. Why, at this moment, you are more dear to him than ever. Dear though you have been. And oh, how dear you have been always. Oh, be kind to him. You are my mother and my father all in one. I need no second parent. It was I for you I spoke. For you alone. Oh, oh, say something, mother. Have I but found one love to, to lose another? Oh, don't tell me that. Oh, mother, you are so cruel. But has he indeed found another love? You know I have loved him always. But we are disgraced. We rank among the outcasts. Gerald is nameless. The sins of the parents should be visited on the children. It is God's law. I was wrong. God's only law is love. Gerald, I cannot give you a father. But I have brought you a wife. Mother, I am not worthy either of her or you. So she comes first, you are worthy. <laughs> and when you are away, Gerald, with her, think of me sometimes. Don't forget me. And when you pray, pray for me. We should pray when we are happiest and you will be happy, Gerald. Oh, you don't think of leaving us. Uh, Mother, you won't leave us. I might bring shame upon you. Mother! For a little, then, and if you let me, near you always. Come out with us to the garden. Oh, later on, later on. Hester and Gerald exit. Mrs. Arbuthnot goes towards the door, stops at the looking glass over the mantelpiece, and looks into it. Alice enters. A gentleman to see you, ma'am? Say I'm not home. Show me the card. Say I will not see him. Lord Illingworth enters. 
Mrs. Arbuthnot sees him in the glass and starts, but does not turn round. Alice exits. What can you have to say to me today, George Harford? You must leave this house. My son may come in at any moment. I saved you last night, and I may not be able to save you again. My son feels my dishonor strongly, terribly strongly. I beg you to go. Last night was excessively unfortunate. That silly Puritan girl making a scene merely because I wanted to kiss her. What harm is there in a kiss? A kiss may ruin a human life, George Harford. I know that all too well. We won't discuss that at present. What is of importance today, as yesterday, is still our son. According to our ridiculous English laws, I can't legitimize Gerald, but I can leave him my property. As for a title, a title is really rather a nuisance in these democratic days. As George Harford, I had everything I wanted. Now I have nearly everything that other people want, which isn't nearly as pleasant. Well, my proposal is this. I told you I was not interested, and I beg you to go. The boy is to be with you for six months in the year, and with me for the other six. <clears throat> that is perfectly fair, is it not? You can have whatever allowance you like and live wherever you choose. As far as your past, no one knows anything about it except myself and Gerald. There is the Puritan, of course. The Puritan in white muslin, but she doesn't count. She couldn't tell the story without explaining that she objected to being kissed, could she? And all the women would think her a fool and the men think her a bore. And you need not be afraid that Gerald won't be my heir. I needn't tell you I have not the slightest intention of marrying. You come too late. My son has no need of you. You are not necessary. What do you mean, Rachel? Look into the garden. She loves him. They love each other. We are safe from you and we are going away. Where? We will not tell you. And if you find us, we will not know you. You seem surprised. What welcome would you get from the girl whose lips you tried to soil, from the boy whose life you have shamed, and from the mother whose dishonor comes from you? You have grown hard, Rachel. I was too weak once. It is well for me that I have changed. I was very young at the time. We men know life too early. And we women know life too late. That is the difference between men and women. Rachel, I want my son. My money may be of no use to him now. I may be of no use to him, but I want my son. There is no room in my boy's life for you. He is not interested in you. Then why does he write me? What do you mean? What letter is this? That is nothing. Give it to me. It is addressed to me. You're not to open it. I forbid you to open it. And in Gerald's handwriting. It was not to have been sent. It is a letter he wrote to you this morning before he saw me. But he is sorry he wrote it. Very sorry you are not to open it. Give it to me. It belongs to me. He opens it, sits down, and reads it slowly. You have read this letter, I suppose, Rachel? No. You know what is in it? Yes. I don't admit for a moment that the boy is right in what he says. I don't admit that it is any duty of mine to marry you. I deny it entirely. But to get my son back, I am ready. Yes, I am ready to marry you, Rachel, and to treat you always with the difference and respect due to my wife. I will marry you as soon as you choose. I give you my word of honor. I decline to marry you, Lord Illingworth. Are you serious? Yes. Do tell me your reasons. They would interest me enormously. I have already explained them to my son. I suppose they were intensely sentimental, weren't they? Oh, you women live by your emotions, and for them you have no philosophy of life. You are right. Women live by our emotions and for them, by our passions and for them, if you will. I have two passions, Lord Illingworth, my love of him and my hate of you. You cannot kill those. They feed each other. So you really refuse to marry me? Yes. And does my son hate me as you do? No. I'm glad of that, Rachel. He merely despises you. <laughs> what a pity. What a pity. 
For him, I mean. Oh, don't be deceived, George. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. May I ask by what arguments you made the boy who wrote this letter, this beautiful, passionate letter, believe that you should not marry his father, the father of your own child? It was not I who made him see it. It was another. What friend de siècle person? The Puritan, Lord Illingworth. He winces, then rises slowly and goes over to the table where his hat and gloves are. Mrs. Arbuthnot is standing close to the table. He picks up one of the gloves and begins pulling it on. How curious. At this moment, you look exactly as you looked the night you left me 20 years ago. You have just the same expression in your mouth. Upon my word, Rachel, no woman ever loved me as you did. Why, you gave yourself to me like a flower to do anything I liked with. You were the prettiest of playthings, the most fascinating of small romances. Oh, quarter to two. Must be strolling back to Hunston. Don't suppose I shall see you there again. I'm sorry. I am, really. <laughs> it's been an amusing experience to have met amongst people of one's own rank and treated quite seriously to one's mistress and one's... This is our butt that snatches up the glove and strikes Lord Illingworth across the face with it. Lord Illingworth starts. He is dazed by the insult of his punishment. Then he controls himself and goes to the window and looks out at his son. He sighs and leaves the room. He would have said it. He would have said it. Gerald and Hester enter from the garden. Well, dear mother, you never came out at all, so we had to come in and fetch you. Mother, it, you have not been crying. My boy. My boy, my boy. She embraces Gerald, running her fingers through his hair. But you have two children now. You'll let me be your daughter? Would you choose me for your mother? You of all women I have ever known. They move towards the door leading into the garden with their arms around each other's waists. Gerald sees Lord Illingworth's glove lying on the floor and picks it up. Hello, Mother. Whose glove is this? You have had a visitor. Who was it? Oh, no one. No one in particular. A man of no importance. A Woman of No Importance by Oscar Wilde. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to give a big shout out to our beautiful cast. Well done. Thank you so much. I also want to um, recognize everybody who's working behind the scenes to make these happen. And I want to invite you next week to join us for Antigone. That is on May 22nd, uh, right here where you're watching this one at 1 p.m. So every Friday at 1 p.m. We're going to head to a talk back with y'all live on Facebook in about five minutes. So in five minutes, uh, refresh your Facebook uh, page here at the studio and you can find us there. Um, and we'll also post it in the comments on this video. You can find a link there to join us for a talk back. If you have some questions about the play, we'd love to chat with you. And um, we just want to thank you for joining us. Be well, be safe and healthy. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.